So uh, thank you, Kas Baker, and also I thank members of the Academy for giving me this uh, opportunity to present our work. So we basically work on uh, a lot of um, uh, analysis of genomic uh, instability, both during mitosis and meiosis in the uh, Baker's yeast as a model system. So today I thought I will focus on our recent work where we looked at genomic instability in mitosis. And the take home point that I want to make is that loss of heterozygosity has been a much underappreciated source of genetic change. And I will try to convey a couple of stories where we see this repeatedly. So the budding yeast is a good model for genomic instability. This is primarily for the students because it's a single cell eukaryote. It has a small generation time, 2.5 hours for mitosis. Also has a small genome size. So that allows you to look at genomic instability easily. So how do these uh, genomic instabilities arise? A lot of the time they happen because of errors during DNA replication, repair, chromosome segregation, and also as a consequence of exposure to various endogenous and exogenous types of DNA damaging agents. So all of these things can cause genomic instability, which could manifest itself as single nucleotide mutations, loss of heterozygosities, uh, gross chromosomal changes, or aneuploidies. So uh, how do we measure this kind of genomic instability? One way to do that is basically by using reporters. So the reporter could be something like an oxytrophic marker or some fluorescent kind of protein marker. And then you look at basically either a gain or loss of function of this reporter, right? And then that can tell you what is the frequency of mutations. But the problem with this method is that it's a localized measure. It's coming from this reporter, which you are then extrapolating to the rest of the genome. And second, you cannot look at mutations that are synony uh, you are, uh, uh, you uh, cannot uh, basically look at mutations, okay, which do not uh, affect protein function. So uh, alternative approach is basically to look at mutation accumulation lines, and uh, these have become very popular nowadays because you can combine it with all these NGS-based methods. So in this method, you basically start off with an ancestral strain, and then you use it to basically set up several independent mutation lines, which are maintained over thousands of generations. At the end of this process, you basically do a whole genome sequencing of these end lines, compare it with that of the parent, and basically look for what kind of genomic instabilities have taken place. <coughs> so the problem with a lot of this work, especially in yeast, has been that most of the strains that we work with in the lab, they are homozygous. That we usually do because, because we want to ensure reproducibility in our results. But the problem with using a homozygous backgrounds is that you cannot look at events like loss of heterozygosity, right? That is something that you can only look at when you have a heterozygous system. So this problem is made even more acute by the fact that when people recently sequenced thousands of cerevisia genomes, for example, what they found is that most of them are actually heterozygous, which means that people have not really quantified what is the effect of loss of heterozygosity, even from a basic biology perspective in terms of driving uh, yeast genome evolution and its variation. So our objective was uh, in this particular, for the purpose of this talk, was to basically look at the contribution of LOH relative to other types of mutations by using heterozygous cerevisia strains. So loss of heterozygosity can occur through various mechanisms. At a very gross level, it can happen because one entire chromosome was lost. Or more frequently, it arises because of mitotic recombination. So basically, you have a double strand break. And although in mitosis, most of the time you try to repair it with the cystochromatid, if you do it with the homolog, okay, you could end up with a LOH. It can also occur because of deletions, translocations and all. But as I said, almost 70% of these are mostly through mitotic recombination based events. So LOH can also basically unmask uh, 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 mutations in uh, tumor suppressor genes, right, which can also drive uh, cancer uh, formation. So it's also important from a clinical perspective to get a good understanding of the frequency and patterns of loss of heterozygosity. So to generate um, the kind of strains that we needed for our work, we used this uh, typical uh, lab strain, S288C, and then we mated it with a um, slightly diverged strain, YGM789, it's a clinical isolate, and another strain, RM11, which is a vineyard strain. So if you make such crosses, you have close to around 50,000 heterozygous markers. And these are uniformly distributed around the genome. And then uh, we basically uh, use these hybrids. So I have abbreviated one of them as SR, that is your S288C with RM11. And S288C with YJM, I am calling it as SY, just to make it easier. So we uh, uh, basically take these strains and then we run it for thousands of divisions. So we do it through single cell bottlenecks. 
So the purpose is that, uh, unlike uh, what Imran, uh, Imran uh, just mentioned, we are not doing evolutionary biology here. We are actually trying to avoid selection. Okay? So by taking it through single cell bottlenecks, we are trying to ensure that whatever mutations are generated, they are accumulating. So at the end of this process, we do whole genome sequencing of these MA lines and compare it with that of the starting parent. So what kind of changes you can look at? By comparing the sequences of these lines to uh, the reference genome sequence, you can look at single nucleotide mutations. You can look at loss of heterozygosities in these uh, uh, head SNP positions. So you can see here if you get switching from GT to T, from CG to G and so on, it becomes homozygous. And then you will have nearby tracks that are still heterozygous, right? So this distance from this uh, head position to this head position would then basically determine the tract size of the LOH. You can also look at things like uh, gross chromosomal changes basically by doing copy number analysis. So when you align the NGS reads to the reference genome, right, in some regions you may be getting more alignment, in some regions you will get less. So this type of copy number variation will basically suggest whether there were any types of segmental deletions, duplications and so on. So all these kind of information you can basically generate. So uh, we basically looked at these SY hybrid lines which I just mentioned after doing mutation accumulation studies. So shown here on the y-axis are the chromosomes and on the x-axis is the base position. Uh, so what you can see is that all the green regions, okay, so these are basically still heterozygous. And then the red locations are basically where you see LOH happening, okay. So as you can see, there is fairly extensive loss of heterozygosity that is going on, although this was supposed to be just a mitotic division, uh, what we think as clonal, okay. Uh, so further, by looking at the patterns of this LOH, you can also infer mechanisms as to how this LOH might have occurred. So if you see tracks like this, which are very long internal, they mostly arise because of mitotic crossovers. Okay? If you see very, very short kind of tracks, these are more likely mitotic gene conversion type events. Sometimes you will see tracks which are running till the very end of the chromosome. Okay? These arise from break induced replication type of events. Sometimes you see a whole chromosome has become, uh, has undergone LOH. It's basically occurring through a chromosome loss followed by reduplication, okay? So, uh, similar patterns we observed in the uh, SR hybrid lines as well. You don't see a lot of those long tracts here, okay, because the image is highly condensed. But you see fairly extensive LOH over here as well. So, in both the hybrids that we looked at, okay, we found extensive LOH with uh, uh, the additional observation that in the SR hybrids, the tract sizes were biased towards shorter events, whereas in the SY hybrids, the LOH tracts were much longer. Okay. So, uh, uh, so this was uh, quite interesting, okay, because it was telling us that uh, how much we were missing out on this important source of variation, because in the lab we are always obsessed with homozygous backgrounds. Okay. And we also used this information to construct an LOH hotspot map for the S288C strain. So on the y-axis, I'm basically showing you the LOH count, and on the x-axis, I'm showing you the uh, chromosome positions. So we saw typically known patterns. You see that LOH is higher at the chromosomal ends. That is something that is known, okay, where you have these telomeric sequences present. We also found a lot of new positions, which basically act like LOH hotspots. Very often, these are flanked by these uh, T, uh, TY elements in yeast, okay. Basically, these are similar to the LTR retrotransposone kind of elements, which are known to stimulate mitotic recombination. So while we were doing all this work, uh, uh, okay, so one more thing I want to mention. So we also looked at uh, the other kinds of mutations, okay. So these are basically the nucle uh, single nucleotide mutations, SNM type of mutations. So those were less abundant compared to the LOH. So in SR, we saw 8 and in SY, we saw 47. Of course, there is a st uh, st uh, strain specific effects. Some backgrounds are showing more mutations than the other. But in general, the number of such in uh, independent events that we were seeing were much less than the number of LOH events that we saw. The same thing when you look at uh, gross chromosomal changes. We uh, uh, found uh, evidence for uh, uh, segmental duplications. So this is where the, uh, if you look at the read coverage, it's much higher compared to the average for the genome. Okay, we saw segmental deletions where the read, number of reads which are mapping in that location are much less okay, than the average. And we also found evidences for aneuploidies where the entire uh, chromosome has undergone a copy number change. Okay? But again, these were fairly rare. And the, by and large, the most important change that we saw was driven by loss of heterozygosity type events. So while we were doing this work, okay, so we uh, basically 
had a, a, a nice collaboration with another group, which was basically working with industrial strains of yeast. Now, unlike the lab strains, which are homozygous, the strains that are used in the industry, they are mostly heterozygous in nature. Okay? And one such strain is this strain called JY270. This strain is used for bioethanol production. It's used for bioethanol production for a variety of reasons. Okay? But one reason which is important is because if you look at the culture morphology, this has a very smooth culture. Where this one, the cells tend to uh, flocculate. Okay? They tend to basically aggregate and sediment and then they produce this foam, okay? which is a problem for fermenters because it will clog. It will clog your fermentation pipelines okay? and it will also decrease the fermentation kinetics. So although JY270 has this nice um, uh, uh, culture morphology, while it is growing inside the fermenter, it occasionally undergoes a switch in the colony morphology, where it goes from these smooth type of cells okay, to this serrated kind of uh, colonies, which basically looks like this then. It basically looks more like S288C. Okay? So for us, this was basically like a mutation accumulation experiment, except that instead of doing it in the lab, it was happening inside the fermenter, where these lines were growing for several months. And when something like this happens, the only choice is to shut down the fermenter and then restart the culture. So we did whole genome sequencing of some of these lines okay, to understand what was really going on. Like everyone, we initially thought maybe some mutation has taken place. But what was surprising is that it was not really a mutation in the sense that it was a base mutation. It was actually being caused by LOH. Okay? Because your parent strain had this locus called AC2, where one copy was inactive. So this AC2 is basically a transcription factor, okay, which controls um, activation of genes that are involved in separating the mother and the uh, daughter cells. So if that doesn't separate properly, that is when you get this kind of rough colony uh, uh, morphology. So what was happening in these rough isolates is that the inactive allele was getting fixed okay, through a loss of heterozygosity type of event. And what was interesting also was that lines which had this primary LOH at AC2 also seem to have secondary LOH at other unselected loci. So we verified this uh, uh, subsequently by looking at a large number of these uh, rough isolates and we did whole genome sequencing of all these lines. And we saw that all of them of course had this mutation at AC2, okay? basically this LOH event at AC2 where the inactive allele has got fixed and they had secondary LOH okay, at other types of locations. So just to make sure that this is not something uh, weird about this particular industrial strain of yeast, okay, we tried to recreate this going back to our S288C YJM hybrid. Okay. Uh, so here we tried to select for a primary LOH by using markers, by using 5-FOA and this uh, marker cannabinin. So 5-FOA uh, is like an analog of uracil. So if the ura3 gene is active, the cells will incorporate this and that will be lethal. Okay. Similarly, cannabinin is basically an analog of arginine. So if the can locus is active, it will basically be lethal for the cell. But if they lose the ura locus or the can locus, okay, then the cells will be able to survive. So like this, you can basically look for a primary LOH event okay, by looking for loss of the ura marker or the can marker. Or you can also do a double selection where both have been lost. And then you see whether additional LOH events have taken place or not. So this basically shows the data for again hundreds of lines that we uh, basically sequenced, which had a primary LOH either at URA3 or at CAN or a double LOH at both URA3 and CAN. And what we saw was that yes, we were seeing signatures of additional secondary LOH events, which, okay, which uh, we did not actually select for. So uh, what this was suggesting was that uh, a phenomena that we basically described as systemic genomic instability, which is also very much relevant for the cancer field. Because if you look at uh, the way people try to explain tumor formation, especially copy number aberrations, okay, there is this uh, gradual CNA model where the cells accumulate these copy number changes over a period of time slowly. And there is this punctuated model where it happens in a very short period of time. So our results are more uh, similar to what we are seeing here, where you have a rapid burst of uh, genomic instability. And we uh, propose that something similar might be also be happening in uh, cancer cells. So just to summarize what I have shown you is that a loss of heterozygosity uh, contributes significantly more than other types of mutations to genomic instability. It has been a very underappreciated source of uh, uh, genomic variation as well, something that people should look at more. LOH patterns are different, of course, based on uh, uh, genetic backgrounds. Uh, we, we basically looked at uh, an, an LOH hotspot map for CEREBCA. Okay, most LOH hotspots are towards chromosomal ends. We also identified new uh, hotspots flanked by PY elements. 
uh, we also saw LOH covering centromere locations. Basically, any, any part of the genome can undergo LOH. We also observed that a number of secondary LOH events are high when there is a pre-existing LOH event, okay? which is basically what we are calling as a systemic genomic instability process. So that has evolution, uh, that has implications for evolutionary biology as well, because people normally think of mutations as something that is happening gradually one by one over a period of time. What we are uh, characterizing here is a systemic genomic instability event where mutations can happen rapidly in a very short period of time. So uh, I hope I have been able to convince you, okay, that LOH, uh, why we have to look at it more carefully and it can be responsible not only for various diseases, but various types of phenotypes, okay, which you might be thinking is being caused by some base mutations or something like that. So with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge the people who have uh, participated in this study and also the groups with which we had collaborations for the industrial uh, strains and also funding from my uh, funding agencies. Thanks. <coughs> Yeah, anything from the students? Do you think about LOH? Uh, maybe something that you have studied it in your uh, degree courses, right? Okay. This is somatic LOH. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, you still have many loci where they don't, you don't see LOH. Yes, Is yes. there some kind of selection or advantage that you see only in some loci LOH? Uh, you mean the secondary LOH events? Uh, no, the first part of your talk, you also mentioned you, you found LOH. There was a track where you have LOH, but flanking regions, there were no LOH. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah, it yes, driven by yeah. natural selection or? Yeah, no, there may be some hotspots for undergoing LOH. So right. that's why we constructed this uh, hotspot map. So some regions of the genome, of course, uh, don't seem to have a lot of LOH. May have to uh, depend upon how frequently it is likely to undergo a double strand break and how likely it is going to repair it uh, using a, a, a homolog if there are repeats flanking it because that can um, stimulate recombination. So that may be the reasons why some regions are showing more LOH compared to others. And also a slightly technical question, you mentioned uh, crossing over and uh Conversion. Yes, yes. Aren't these same? Uh, no. The mitotic conversion has to go through crossing over, right? Or uh, no, no. Uh, so a gene conversion can happen when you get a strand invasion. Right. It undergoes some amount of DNA synthesis, yes. disengages, right. and then goes back and anneals. Yeah. So then you get only a conversion tract. A crossover you get if it extends, captures the opposite end of the double strand break, generating a holiday junction. Okay. And then that gets repaired. So one so is a single strand event, other is a double strand. Yeah. yeah, yeah so uh, uh, a crossover may or may not have a conversion, yeah. but a conversion will not have a crossover. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just uh, your CAN and five FOA experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like you need just the loss of one copy to get resistance. Uh, no. So they uh, they are already heterozygous to begin with. So they are already heterozygous to begin with, and then we are selecting for the loss of the wild type copy. So that is your primary LOH. Okay, and any correlation between chromatin structures and... Uh, okay, okay, okay. No, no, we have not looked at those kind of things. What we, what we have done is we have tried to move around these markers. So if you look at uh, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, figure, initially we placed these markers on chromosome 4 and 5. Then we shifted them to, I have not shown that slide, we, we shifted them to another chromosomal location just to see whether it was some chromosomal context specific effect that was uh, causing it. So we did not find evidence for that. So just one last question. Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, I'm a little bit surprised at the speed at which this is happening. Is it uh, that frequent? That means you start with a heterozygous culture, mm. roll it up, purify a clone, mm. and then analyze its content and mm. find LO. Yeah, so we think this might be caused by transient fluctuations in gene expression. Repair may be transiently either, I mean, their expressions may be down, and that causes this transient hypermutable state. Yeah. 
Yes, so two uh, small questions. One mm. is, uh, do you see that your hotspots, obviously it makes sense for them mm. to be at places where there is uh, mm. DNA repair activity, mm. but do you see an overlap with the epigenetic uh, modification markers, first question. Mm. And second question is when you assemble these genomes through NGS, Hmm. Did you do a de novo assembly or a reference-based assembly? Okay, the second part I can answer quickly because uh, these are not new genomes. Uh, these are genomes which are already sequenced, so we don't have to do any assembly here. Although the strains are slightly different, but they all be used S288C as our assembly platform. Except for the very ends of the chromosome where there may be structural variations, the bulk of the genome is virtually identical, so no assembly is required. The second part of the question, uh, we have not gone into what you are asking in terms of whether there are any epigenetic marks uh, surrounding these uh, locations which have high rates of LOH and all. So we are getting into those areas. We are trying to look at the genetic basis for differences in LOH frequency, genetic basis for differences in LOH track length. There is not much information actually. There have been studies on LOH frequency. People have reported always genetic screens that elevate LOH frequencies. Not much information on what causes track lengths to be different and all. So people, uh, we are just uh, starting to dig into all this, yeah. yeah. Uh, this may be a little unrelated, um, but uh, how good is the uh, Easter system to study human tumor synthesis? Okay. If, if it's a good system, mm. in your uh, genome-wide map of LOH, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, high frequency, mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at any uh, such tumor suppressors there? Do you, because uh -huh. one, one okay. of the major mechanisms of loss of tumor suppressor activity is LOH. Yes, 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 yes. No, uh, uh, yeast is yeast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to stretch it too much. But the mechanisms in terms of the contributions of LOH and various uh, LOH uh, mechanisms themselves, right? Uh, that, for looking at that, yeast is excellent. Yeah, but eventually one would have to actually look at it in uh, tumor samples to answer the kind yeah, of questions. Yeah, tumor samples are not very as simple to study yeah, yeah, these yeah, things yeah, for, yeah, uh, yeah. for, you know, clonal variation. Yes, yes, lot, yes, lot yes. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will so be a lot more expensive. Yeah. if we need to study, yeah, yeah. this would be a yeah, yeah, nice yeah, system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now oh, there's a question. Yeah, this one from the student, yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Sir, is there any way this LOH phenomenon can be used for the human benefit? Uh, any way the LOH? Uh, the phenomenon, the mechanism, oh. can it be any way used for the human benefit? <coughs> uh, well, uh, you cannot use it. You can, <laughs> you can use it as part of genetic engineering, for example, you want to inactivate something. Right, you can trigger double stand breaks selectively. There are nucleases where you can selectively put double stand breaks. If you wish to inactivate something through LOH, that can be done. Okay, as part of your genetic engineering toolkit, one can use LOH as a. Or you can make as a, a duplication of the ACE gene so yeah. that you don't get blocking of the pipeline. Yeah, so that uh, so so, so uh, yeah. If you if you see it that way, because our one of our results, okay, was to explain why these industries are suffering from this kind of issue in the yeast but that is using yeast as a as a as a as a, as a model yeah in this in this system we can do it that way because many of these uh, organisms they have a lot of industrial applications right so one can use this kind of knowledge to uh, address such issues yeah thank you Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's just a transcription factor that controls the expression of a lot of genes that are involved in uh, mother cell daughter separation, septation. So these mutants have a septation defect. That's why they have that rough uh, colony morphology because the m mother and daughter cell don't separate cleanly. So you don't get that smooth morphology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you call it AC2. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's, has this heterozygous, been fixed for uh, So, the strains that, uh, so they used in the industry, okay, so they begin with a heterozygous copy. So, we actually think that uh, although it is a nuisance for humans, the yeast is actually using it for adaptation. In the fermenter, it is exposed to a lot of stress. By, by, by accessing this uh, ACE mutant phenotype through an LOH, 
it is able to maybe uh, because it will form a filamentous kind of structure right it will form aggregates which will allow it to better tolerate the harsh conditions that we are putting it through so yeast is actually doing it for its own benefit it's just that it's a nuisance for us Thank you. Thank you, Kasparov. Yeah.